It's Friday, the sun is shining, my finger probably won't fall off, everything is, is going well. So I have, have some birds to start out with today, sticking with the theme of birds uh, in trees, but this time birds inside trees rather than on trees. Here we have a couple uh, starling chicks. Uh, starlings, they... Uh, may may look adorable, but they have a uh, villainous reputation uh, among at least North American birders because they aren't native to North American and North America, and uh, they are an invasive species that tends to take uh, nests from from native birds. So they're not they're not the best that way, but they still do work hard to bring uh, bugs and and whatnot to to the babies. Uh, going back and forth over and over, bringing more more food. Uh, even though birds don't sweat, this this parent looks a, a little bedraggled to me. Um, we also have uh, woodpeckers that live in trees. Most common birds you'll find inside a tree. So this is a a female flicker uh, on the larger side of woodpeckers, and and here's a a juvenile juvenile male. Uh, flicker, you can see how much uh, how much bigger the the adult is. And finally, this is a uh, white-headed uh, woodpecker, appropriately named, um, bringing uh, ants or or something there uh, to the babies. This looks like it might even be a, a telephone pole that it has a nest in. I once um, in in Seattle there was a large pileated woodpecker that was just like hammering on a telephone pole right outside my bedroom window every morning for a week. I'd wake up to da, 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 on a telephone pole. All right. What questions do you have about the lab images, NumPy arrays, nested lists, anything like that? All right, so start. I'd like to again touch on uh, computer use uh, in class. I've uh, been hearing about it and, and seeing kind of uh, some some distraction we're we're having with uh, with the computers, and that's like if if you're um, paying attention to to what's on on the laptop instead of what we're doing in class. That, that's your choice, I, I leave that up to you, but this is a place where we're all here to help each other learn together and stuff going on on screens that's not relevant to class uh, can certainly be distracting to folks around you. So what I'd like to, to have us try is to <clears throat> keep laptops closed unless we are doing a code writing exercise uh, if you absolutely need the, the laptop to, to take notes, things like that, I would ask that you sit uh, in the back two rows just to minimize the, uh, the number of folks who might be, might, might be distracted by that. All right. Thank you. Other thing I'd like to start out with is the uh, week six quiz is available this time in two parts. Uh, it's two parts just because of the way Gradescope works. not possible to put two different kinds of assignments together. Uh, part one is the same kind of quiz we've done for the last couple. There's a quiz6.py. Uh, there are a couple functions here. Uh, one which is estimating, uh, calculating how, much, how many minutes it will take for a population of bacteria to double. Uh, takes in an initial population number of bacteria and a growth rate and should return the number of minutes it will take for that population to double. Uh, more about that in the comments. Uh, and then the second function, brightest pixel location, takes in an image array. So this is number of rows, number of columns, and then at each row column there's uh, uh, three the three color values and an inner list. And this brightest pixel location function should return the row and column, a tuple of the row and column, where the brightest pixel in the image is, which just means the largest, like red plus green plus blue value. 
it's like the most uh, the most color there. Uh, that's part one of the quiz is these two functions submit the code to Gradescope. It will run some tests. Uh, part two is uh, four short answer questions uh, about some different uh, versions of a uh, of a function. And I'm just looking for a few sentences for each of these. Uh, this will be manually graded after the quiz is due. So there won't be immediate feedback on, on this part two. Uh, and as usual, this will be due Monday, uh, 9 p.m. Any questions on the on the quiz? All righty. So today we are launching on a new topic, uh, and this is one where we're going to be pulling back the veil to show what's been going on the whole time. Uh, and this is, we're going to spend uh, today and the next couple classes after this talking about objects, which are a sort of fundamental piece of what's been going on with everything we've been doing in Python. Um, and we just are now going to kind of open up this box and see what's inside. So we have seen before functions, ability to define a set of steps once and then uh, call it or uh, perform those steps uh, in uh, many times in, in different places. We've also, of course, seen computer systems ability to store data in a variable that we can refer to later. And objects are a way to combine these two things into a single unit within the computer system, a way to have some data and also have some functions associated with a particular kind of thing. And as like I said, we've been working with objects this whole time. So for example, uh, I've mentioned before the term method, which is a function that's associated with a particular object. And some places where the where we've seen this on say previous labs in uh, lab three gerrymandering we did something like line dot strip. This dot strip is a string method. It's one of these functions that's associated with a particular object. In this case, we had a line from our data file and we wanted to, uh, not, sorry, strip. We did split is the one that I was thinking of, though we did have um, come across strip as well. Uh, but we wanted to split up our line over data file where the commas were, so we used a string method to do that. The PGL graphic stuff that we were doing with Breakout was full of methods. Uh, things like ball.setFilled uh, or GW add ball. The set filled and add are, fu are functions. They take some, some parameters as input and they're associated with a particular object. We were setting that the, the ball on the screen was going to be filled with a color and our graphics window, we were telling it to add the ball to the objects that were being displayed. So. Methods, we've seen a lot. We're going to see how those are actually defined uh, in code today. Uh, we've also
seen the use of attributes or fields. Uh, this is data that's associated with an object, just like a, a method is a function that's associated with an object, an attribute or field. Uh, these are in, in Python, it's typically called attributes. In many other languages, field is more commonly used, but they're uh, for our purposes interchangeable. And uh, a recent example that we've seen with this is When we had our image array and we said dot shape, what we got back was a tuple uh, with the dimensions of our image, like 702 rows, 1,024 columns, and uh, four values per uh, pixel. And notice we don't have parentheses after this. We're not calling a, sh a, sh a function called shape. We're just, there's a variable called shape that is associated with each NumPy array, and so we can get the shape of this particular one, the whatever array is stored in our variable image, and uh, uh, access that, that field. And in, in both cases, I want to draw your attention to the syntax where we have the object is appearing to the left of our of our period and then our attribute or our method which we're applying with that object comes comes after it so the interesting and powerful thing is that python actually lets us define new objects so far we've just been using objects that were uh, built into Python that were defined in, in NumPy or, or as we'll see, uh, defined by me. But we can define a new object. This also has a term associated with it. And that is class. So when we talk about functions, we talk about a function definition and then a function call. So we have kind of terminology to distinguish between the definition and how when we use it. Objects, we have a special term meaning the definition of an object, and that's referred to as a class. And we can have many instances of a class. So just like we defined a function once and then could call it many places, we define a class once saying like this is what it means to be uh, like a, a, a G-rect, say. This is what it means to be a, a graphics rectangle. And then we can create many instances of a G-rect making our kind of grid of bricks for the breakout game. And it's all, we, we, PGL just kind of wrote down once, here's what it means to be a G-Rect, here are its methods, here are its data, and then we can create a bunch of distinct uh, G-Rects, all with their kind of own separate data. Questions on this so far? What, what's not clear? Gabby. So when we have a class of objects, it's still just a single object. Like, we're still describing a single... Actually, I'm just confusing my thought. Never mind. But thank you. Yeah, I think our, uh, our best kind of analogy to what we've seen before is that we kind of have one function definition, uh, and then we have a bunch of calls to that function that say, like, do this function. Um, objects are like like a like our, our rectangles on a screen, a thing that we can like create in the 
computer system and that it can keep track of. And so we just define once like what that rectangle is and can create, create it multiple times. Uh, other questions? When you Everyone. access like attributes in an um, object, you don't need like getter or setter method. You can just call it image dot shape like that. Yeah. So the the question is, do we need uh, getter or setter methods? Uh, this is uh, terminology that's that's often used in in the programming language Java, um, and uh, in this case. We any data that's inside an object, we can always just just access it with this sort of syntax. Uh, there's no uh, if you use other programming languages, you may have seen that uh, objects kind of have different restrictions on them. Uh, but in Python, we can just access any data inside an object. Other questions. All right, I have a thought exercise for you. I would like you to discuss with your neighbors uh, what we might need or, or how we might, given what we already know, represent a deck of cards. So 52 cards, there are four different suits. Uh, the cards are like one through 10, and then jack, queen, king, ace. So if... <coughs> We wanted in Python to like represent a deck of cards. Uh, discuss with your neighbors how you might approach that. So let's start with what is what is the data that we what is some data we would need to keep track of, or that would need to be part of our our deck of cards. Yes, sir. Um, the attributes like spade, ace, heart. <laughs> yeah, we need to. Keep track of the, the suit of each card, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. We definitely need to know that. What else? Sammy. The number associated with each one, or if it's a giant queen king. Yeah, some sort of value, whatever the uh, whatever goes goes on the card. Um, and so this do do we need one suit and one value or kind of what what do we need to do with a suit and value, Emma? Uh, you need to define like in each suit, like the one, two, three, four, not really one, two, three, four, but like space, hearts, jacks, love jacks, anyways. But you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the value is like one through ten, and then jack, queen, king. And then outside of both of those, we need to define two more values, I think, of like the joker. Yeah, for for sure. If we If we want to include jokers that's beyond our, our 52 cards. So we'll just imagine we're just doing like the 52 cards without, without any, any jokers, but absolutely right. Uh, we need a suit and a value for each of our, our 52 cards has a suit and a value. So all throughout there, what if I had uh, 104 variables, 52 suits, 52 values? Are, are we happy with that? Is there, is there maybe a, a better way than 104 separate variables? Gabby? But like, at the very least, this is like Yeah, so I, I like the way that, that you're thinking. We have four possible suits, uh, 13 possible values, and we want, I, I like the way you said, we want to combine these two. So I'll throw out something else. we might be able to combine them into tuples. Like we just, each card is a tuple, it has a suit 
and a value as the first and, and second elements of, of the tuple. Ezra? I, I would also say make a card class, like a card object, and have the pursuit and the value be any of the values associated with that, but as attributes of the card, of, of each card. Yeah, so, so you're uh, uh, pointing the way to, to where we're headed, that we, we do uh, we do want to create a class to represent a card, and then we can have its attributes be its suit and its value. But for the moment, thinking about this tuple approach, let's say I said uh, C equals the five of hearts. If I want to refer to the uh, the suit, uh, well, I got these backwards, didn't I? I said that there would be a suit and a value. There we go. If I want to refer to the suit of the card C, how would I do that? Ezra? Uh, you just go C square bracket zero, because that's, that's the suit is the first part of the tuple. Exactly. That if I make, if all my cards are a tuple and they have the suit as the first part, I refer to the suit by bracket zero. But that means I have to remember everywhere in my code that I see like a card bracket zero. Oh, that means the suit. And card bracket one means the value. And this is going to kind of make the um, uh, make the code kind of hard hard to read if I just have these zeros and ones everywhere and I have to remember which is suit which is value. Could maybe use a, a trick where define some constant such as suit index and use that instead of bracket zero. So now I have like C bracket suit index and C bracket value index. But nevertheless, the tuple, I'm relying on indexing. And to Ezra's point, it would be nice if I could just say like C dot suit or C dot value to refer to, um, refer to the, those attributes. Furthermore, if I do print C, what I'm going to get out is exactly what I have here is going to be parentheses, it's going to be a string that has a heart and a, and a five, and what I would ideally want is for it to print out five of hearts. But as long as it's a tuple, just printing it, I'm just going to get the tuple. And so this is another advantage of having a class in Python, is that we can actually control how it gets printed. We aren't at the, at the mercy of just like printing everything as a tuple or needing to write our own function that like can take any tuple and turn it into the string that we want. We can kind of bring all of this inside the class, our functions plus our data living in harmony together. All right, so I want to start off my uh, car.py here and A class definition starts with the word class, followed by the name that I'm giving this class. By convention, class names are capitalized. So I've done capital C card. Then I have a colon, and then inside here, uh, 
I am defining what a card object is. Like that's the purpose of the card class is to define all the data and all the functions that go along with a card object. <coughs> so one thing that we have done with objects in the past is we have created them. We have said something like, Paddle equals G rect of blah, 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 given it a X and Y and a width and height to for, for our rectangle. And so as part of defining what a G rect was, PGL had to define how to create a G rect. And so that's the first thing we're going to do for our card is... Define what's called the constructor. Define a function that is creating or, or setting up a new, a new card object. This has a funny looking name in Python. Uh, it's a function, so we start it with def. And it's a function, but since it's a function that's inside uh, a class definition, we would call it a method. It's a card method. And the constructor always goes by the name underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And this is a, a particular choice of, of Python to have a bunch of special method names that all have these double underscores around them that indicate that it's some kind of built-in part of Python. So, for example, creating a new object, that's something that all objects need to do. And so we have this special name for the method that is part of that kind of create a new object process. Now, what, when we're creating a new card and setting it up, what might we need to know? In terms of our object is function plus data, is there any data that we need to know to make a new card? John? Suit and number? Yeah, we need the suit and we need the value. So I'm going to make those parameters inputs to our constructor. Like this is the stuff that the card class needs in order to like set up a new card object. It needs to be able to give it a suit and give it a value. So we have these, these parameters, uh, but there's this thing that in the past I just sort of hand waved and said, Python will take care of this for us, let's not think about it. Well. Uh, it is time for us to think about the self. Because all Python methods, the first parameter that will show up is self. And so to talk about what this means, I want to look at a method that we've used before. And it's the, the PGL uh, method set color. So when we created the, the ball or the paddle or the bricks, we use like ball.setColor, paddle.setColor, brick.setColor. Uh, and here's the definition for set color. It takes in a color, our black, red, blue, what have you. And like all methods, its first parameter is self. And The purpose of self is to refer to the current object. And so when I say ball set color black, 
I'm setting the color to black, but the question is, I'm, what am I setting the color of? What thing on the screen, what graphics object am I setting the color of? Well, in this case, it's the ball. Inside this definition of set color, self is representing whatever thing I'm actually setting the color of. And so we can see I'm accessing the attribute color of self of whatever the current object is. And I'm also using self to access a method of the current object, calling the update color method of whatever, uh, whatever we're setting the color of. And I had previously told you that Python fills in the self parameters for us. We don't have to provide them. And what is happening is Python takes whatever is before the dot. So after the dot comes our method name, and then inside the parentheses, whatever parameters, whatever inputs that method requires besides self, and Python will take whatever comes before the dot, whatever object is here, whatever variable is here, and it will fill it in such that this is essentially doing set color ball black, where ball is what is going to be filled in for self in the code that we see on the screen. I'm not claiming that this is the most straightforward syntax one could ever design, but it is quite common across many different programming languages that we have some special way of referring to the current object inside a class definition, it happens to be self in Python, and that we call objects methods with this dot syntax where Kind of the, the thing that is the current object for the purpose of that method call is what comes before the dot. All right, what, what, are, your, what are your questions on, on this? What, what could I explain more or better? John? So just like looking at the example of the color thing on the board, if like, what is the update color if set color is like a different function? Why does it then use another function inside itself? So, what is happening here is we're changing the color attribute, this piece of data associated with a graphics object, to be a different color. But then to actually get that change to show up on the screen, that's what update color is for. Update color says, Okay, make sure that the color on the screen and the color in this color attribute are the same. So it just kind of syncs those up. And in this case, they're separate methods just because maybe you want to be able to synchronize this color without separately from, from setting the color. So they made them different things. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so let's finish our card constructor now that we have self, suit, and value. The typical thing that we'll do in one of these constructors, these init methods, is just initialize, set the values of any attributes this object has. And so I want the objects the card suit attribute to be whatever this suit parameter is. And I want whatever, uh, I want the value attribute of the card we're making to be whatever was given to us as this value parameter. The syntax for using one of these constructors is like the like when we created grex or, or other things we had the name of the class called as a function with the parameters that its init method takes so for our card i would say c equals card 
of I give it a suit. I have little Unicode strings here. So I'm creating the five of hearts by using the class name, calling it with the uh, with values that I, I want passed to this init. I can print C, print C dot value, print C dot suit, just to check that this all, this all worked. So when I print C, I see this mess saying main dot capital C card object at some string of numbers and letters. When I print out C dot value and C dot suit, I see five and a heart. So the reason I'm seeing this mess is that my card object doesn't know how, I haven't told it how to turn itself into a string for the purposes of being displayed. And when I don't tell, when I, when I don't, tell a class how to turn itself into a string, it by default does this like really kind of technical thing where it's saying, okay, this is a card object and it's stored at this location in the computer's memory. Not very useful for you know, displaying what card it is. It's sort of Python just exposing some underlying details because we haven't told it what else it should do when we want to display a card as a string. Questions so far? Rebecca? Um, why did you place C equals card out of the definition? That's, uh, that's a good question. So why is the C equals card outside of uh, either this init definition or the class definition? So it's a similar idea to where I define a function and then outside of that function I call it. So what I've done here is I've defined a card class, and then outside of that, I've created an instance, a card object, using that class definition. Other questions? All right, so... I would like to solve our uh, printing a card problem. And there's another one of these double underscore methods that I can define that will be auto that will be used whenever we try to print uh, print a card. So if I define the underscore underscore wrapper, not slef method, wrapper short for representation. This method will be called whenever we go to print a card or otherwise turn it into a string. And so this method needs to return whatever we want the string version of the card to be. So I might just say return The value, self.value, so the value of whatever card it, it ha, is the, the repr method is being called for, plus a space, plus the suit. So with this, when I go to print out the card, Instead of giving us that weird like card object at zero uh, uh, x ten one zero eight and so on, it calls this wrapper method and uses whatever string that returns. Cool. Does self dot value need to be a string? If I don't make self dot value a string, I will get a type error when I try and add an int to the string space of space. So I, what I'm trying to do is concatenate two strings to produce a bigger string, but then both things on 
uh, on either side of the plus need to be a string. So that's why I needed to, because I knew self was a va uh, self was an int. Uh, I knew I needed to to turn it uh, into a string to be able to to concatenate it. Other question? Yeah, Max. So does Python know that because you use wrapper that whenever you print C, it should do self dot wrapper, or did you call C dot Yes. So, uh, even before I defined this wrapper, mm -hmm. there was like the default wrapper was being called when it was printed, and that's what was giving us underscore underscore main dot card object at blah, blah blah. So, like that is defined for any kind of object, and what I've done for card is defined uh, a wrapper method specific to card, and it will if if you define one for an object, that's the one that will be used rather than that that default one. Other questions? All right. So on uh, uh, on the the course calendar, there's a more uh, there's a, a slightly more complete version of, of the card class that handles turning uh, the values for Jack, Queen, King, Ace into strings and that has some card to, uh, code to actually create a list of cards. Um, so uh, please take a look at that if you're interested. Um, but for now, I'd like to do a bit of practice with uh, what we've learned about objects so far, here we go. So, talked about the constructor, the init method. Uh, what is one purpose of this method? All right, please discuss with your neighbors uh, why you're thinking it's the one you chose. All right, we've had a movement toward B, which is, uh, in fact, of the reasons listed here, uh, the one that, that matches the purpose of the of the constructor, uh, I will say that D is something that needs to happen. It's just not something that init does. In Python, we don't ever need to write code that does D. That Python just takes care of for us. Other languages that you might use if you take more computer science classes, like the language C, you have to write code that does D. But <laughs> Python, it's nice. We don't have to have to worry about that. But we do have to give our uh, our student value attributes, uh, which I realize I called on this a yet another term for the same thing. Is an object oriented programming lovely? Is instance variable. That is a variable that is associated with a particular instance of an object. So we have a card class, and then every card object is an instance of that class, and each of those instances has a feel, has a value and a suit, and so each of those suit and values are instance variables or attributes or fields. Uh, unfortunately, you will encounter all these, these terms, so it's useful to, to know that they all mean the same thing. Uh, questions on this? All right, one more. What does self represent in a class definition? All right, big uh, big vote for for a sense of oneness. I appreciate that. Uh, this will this will indeed be the the instance of the class on which the current operation is being performed. So, inside our method definitions, self is always going to be whichever object. We just called uh, this method was called on. Uh, questions about about self? All right. 
So a couple more things I'd like to, to get to. Uh, the first is um, uh, showing you that if we think back to lab uh, one, the prisoner's dilemma, uh, for that lab, we used a history thing. There was a history.py, and it was, there were, in this case, uh, uh, we had like history dot get most recent. Now, we know that the syntax history dot get most recent is calling the method of an object. And we can, in fact, look at history.py and see it's just a class that I defined for the purposes of lab one because at the time that we did lab one we didn't yet know about lists and so the list was actually just inside this history class with a bunch of descriptive names for getting things out of the list. So now if we had a list that we were appending stuff to, we know that that list like bracket negative one gets the last thing in the list, but we can have an object that gives that operation a name, get most recent, and then just returns self.history bracket negative one. So this history class that you used in lab one just had uh, uh, an attribute inside of it that was a list of either C or D uh, and it got appended to through the uh, add action method self.history.append uh, and then the rest were just returning various portions of the list. A couple of things that I would like to, to point out that we haven't uh, that I haven't talked about before. One are these things in triple quotes. So in, in Python, uh, if I have a string in just a single pair of quotes, it can only be on one line. If I have a string in triple quotes, I, it can spread across multiple lines. This means that I can use these triple quoted strings as if they are comments because a line of Python that just has a string and nothing else on it has no effect. And so these triple quoted strings actually are called doc strings, short for documentation strings in Python. And you may have noticed both in the PGL code that I showed, as well as this history code, these triple quoted strings are providing documentation kind of for these different methods. And the cool thing is there are tools that can take these doc strings and automatically produce a nice web page out of them. And you might remember that there was a history documentation web page for lab one. And we see here a representation of the action history, blah, blah, blah. This was just taking the docs, the, the doc string that was in the code and putting it into this web page. And so it took every the declaration of every method and the associated documentation string and put them in this nice web page with the ability to pull up pull up the source code and down in the lower right here generated by pdoc 0.6.3 so this is just a, a tool that you can give it a python file with a class definition and these documentation strings and it will produce a web page like this Other thing is this raise runtime error. So assuming this if statement was not here and someone called get most recent when there wasn't anything in this history list, what would happen? Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna hit an error and it's gonna print out and 
Do you know what kind of error it will print out? Uh, index. Yeah, it will print out index error, uh, like index negative one out of range. Which means that if I call get most recent, I might get back an error that seemingly has nothing to do with the history object. It's telling me about indexing and like negative one and what does that have to do with getting the most recent. And so instead I can write an if statement that like checks is this like error uh, going to occur. And then instead of letting the error occur, I can create my own error. That's what this special word raise does. I can create an error that has a more informative message that I can write as a string. So instead of an index error, it says runtime error, can I get the most recent action from an empty history? So it's a way, it's still going to be an error, but it's going to be an error with a message that is appropriate for this object rather than this like index error that's specific to what's going on inside the object. All right, what are your questions about... Uh, this history code, any of the object stuff we've been talking about. Sammy. So I know it allows you to add single quotes and double quotes. Does double quotes do anything or not? Uh, no, there's no, there's nothing special about putting two pairs of, of quotes around something. Cool. Does Python have its own hidden class for regular variables you make? Um, in fact, Everything in Python is an object. So our ints, our strings, um, our lists, these are all, there's a list class, there's an int class, there's a, uh, an str, a string class, and we've used, like, when we append to a list, that's using a method of the list class. When we uh, uh, call split, on, uh, on a, a string, that's the split method of, of the string class. Uh, when we open a file and call read lines, that's the read lines method of the file class. So everything in Python is actually, is actually an object. Other questions? All right, we have a few minutes, so I'd like for you to work with your neighbors to try and complete this class definition. Where I want a 2D point class with an X and Y. So I'll put this side by side with what we did for card. So work with your neighbors to try and fill in the question marks uh, in this point class definition. All right. Any thoughts on what parameters init our point classes init should take? Gary? Uh, self, X, and Y. Self, X, and, and Y. I, I like it. Someone else, how might we use those parameters in our method definition? Sammy? Self dot X is equal to X, self dot Y is equal to Y. Indeed. And this is a a very common pattern we'll see that we want to construct an object. It takes in exactly the parameters that are its attributes and then assigns them uh, uh, like this just so that we can kind of create a point with a given x and y uh, using this constructor. Uh, that will do it for week six. Uh, remember the quiz due on Monday. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you then.